All right. Good evening, and thank you all for joining us tonight. I am uh, so very excited to welcome our guest speakers tonight and to have all of you join us for this special event. Uh, tonight's lecture has been organized and co-sponsored uh, by the Association of Professional Archaeologists in Brunswick, the Nova Scotia Archaeology Society, and the University of Toronto's Archaeology Centre. Um, and before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we have people here in attendance from all over the Northeast region tonight, but no matter where you reside this evening, the land on which we are all gathered is the traditional unceded territory of the Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. And here in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, we're on the unsurrendered and unceded traditional territory of the Wustuguiuk, the Pesmaquoddy, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. Uh, the ter this territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, uh, which these nations first signed with the British Crown in 1726. And those treaties do not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized an indigenous title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. In Toronto, the land on which our colleagues operate has for thousands of years been the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And we acknowledge, uh, we honor and acknowledge all indigenous people who are here now, who have been here for time and memorial and will continue to be here in the future. We recognize the enduring impact that ind Indigenous genocide has had and the continued oppression of Indigenous peoples, their voices, cultures, and spir spiritualities. And we also recognize that this land we also recognize this land acknowledgement not as some empty institutional gesture, but as a means to reaffirm our professional commitment and obligation to honoring the land we occupy, and uplifting Indigenous voices and communities, and to dismantling the ongoing legacies of set settler colonialism. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Trevor Dow, and I'm the president of the Association of Professional Archaeologists of New Brunswick, and it's my great honor to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of our organization, as well as the Nova Scotia Arc Society and the University of Toronto's Arc Center for this special event. Um, both the APA and B and the NSAS host regular monthly lectures like this as part of our uh, ongoing efforts to promote the amazing work being done uh, in the Northeast region. So if you'd like to stay up to date with those activities, please consider following our organizations uh, on social media to stay up to date uh, on all of our events. Um, uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge that this evening's event has been funded in part uh, by the Register of Professional Archaeologists Public Education and Outreach Grants. And I would like to thank the RPA for their continued support of our public education and community engagement efforts. Now I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Catherine Patton from the Arc Center at the University of Toronto. Uh, who will introduce tonight's speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Michelle Lelievre is an Aglasiosk from Unamagi, who currently works as an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology and American Studies program at William & Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. Uh, Cynthia Martin is a ceramic ceramicist and textile artist with a BFA from NASCAD University. She's also a former landscaper and current mother, grandmother, and member of the Millbrook Nation, First Nation. Hannah Martin is Mi'kmaq from Tahamagush, Tahamagush, uh, a little crossing place, or Tatamagush, on the Northern Northumberland Strait, and a member of Millbrook First Nation. She is currently an associate with First Peoples Group. Sarah Brooks is an artist, craft per craftsperson, and knowledge seeker. Graduating from NASCAD University in 2019, she received her BFA majoring in textiles with a minor in art history. Sarah is Mi'kmaq First Nation of Sigipnagadi, uh, Nova Scotia. Since graduating in 2019, Sarah has been employed through uh, the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq and St. Mary's University contributing to the project titled Tan Wedjisqualiadieg, Mi'kmaq Place Names. Sarah is currently an MFA candidate at NASCAD University and is set to graduate in the spring of 2022. Uh, Mallory Moran is a Glasio or English speaking woman from Massachusetts who completed her PhD in anthropology from William and Mary in 2020 and is currently Chief Archaeologist for Parks Canada Cape Breton Field Unit. And with that, I'll hand uh, things over to uh, all of you. Thanks very much. 
Thank you so much, Catherine. And just I'm just um, getting back to our title slide here as I try to bring up our first um, our PowerPoint presentation. Let's just hopefully that is working. Wonderful. And um, Wulaliok, thank you to everybody for having us. Thank you to the Association of Professional Archaeologists of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia Archaeological Society, and the Archaeology Center at the University of Toronto for making this event happen, for your generous support to make sure that all of our speakers could join us tonight. So um, thank you. And we are going to be speaking, all of us tonight, about how we have been expanding the circle of ancestral knowledge in the Signic and Sebanagadi districts of Mi'kma'ki. And, uh, and welcome to today's palindrome date. I'm very excited that we're presenting on 22222 today. <laughs> okay, let me make sure I can advance these slides. Okay. Um, and so I was very grateful for Trevor's acknowledgement. I also want to acknowledge where I am speaking from today as well on, on Turtle Island, specifically from the state known as Virginia, um, with lots of connections between Virginia and Mi'kma'ki. So here at William & Mary, we acknowledge that the indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the land that we are on today, or that I am on today, include the Cherokahana, the Nautaue, the Chickahominy, the Eastern Chickahominy, the Mattapanai, the Monacan, the Nansamond, the Nautaway, the Pamunkey, the Potawomek, the Upper Mattapanai, and the Rappahannock tribes. And we pay our respect to their tribal members, both past and present. We tonight would like to dedicate our presentation to two important elders, Mi'kmaq elders, that are pictured here. Um, Doug Knockwood on the left and Charlie Paul on the right. These are two elders who spent um, part of their childhoods in Hosmenk or Nouveau Lake or at the lake and we'll be spending a lot of time discussing our work at Hosmenk um, over the last few years tonight. So we want to dedicate our presentation to them um, and also just to honor all of the Ilnuk um, of Mi'kmaq, their lands and their waters, um, both in the past and the present. So a brief outline of what we'll be talking about tonight, um, kind of I'll speak a little bit first to start us off about this theme of expanding the circle of ancestral knowledge. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about the region where we're working. And so get into some of the differences between the Signet, the um, Sabaganagadi district, and also what we often refer to as, our group often refers to as the Shignecto Peninsula. We'll talk a little bit about those differences. Um, about the overview of our research over the last number of years. As I mentioned, we'll spend a lot of time talking about Homespec, and then what each of us has done as a way to kind of center our conversation, our contributions to tonight's presentation, is we've thought how, how each of us have met the ancestors through the work that we've engaged with this project. And as we've said, this project has taken us all in many different and unexpected and amazing directions. And that's part of the reason we have five people from the project who are going to speak about it tonight. And we'll end um, with a couple of notes about where we hope to head in the future. Okay. So we, um, our team has expanded from the first years of this project, which began in 2016 when um, Mallory Moran, who was a PhD candidate in anthropology at William Mary at the time, joined Jody Howe, who is probably very familiar to many archaeologists working in Nova Scotia, um, and myself, a very small crew working uh, in the um, Shignecto Peninsula area, um, doing some testing that we will talk about a few slides from now. In 2017, we expanded our team to include Cynthia Martin and Alyssa Abram, who uh, were very excited to join us and we learned a great deal from them and we'll talk about how our knowledge grew in 2017, in part through the knowledge we were creating and learning from each other. In 2018, we welcomed Vanessa Smith, who I think I saw is on the Zoom tonight, who is now the Assistant Curator of Archaeology at the Nova Scotia Museum. She lent her excavation and photography expertise to our project in 2018. In 2019, we also welcomed a recent archaeology grad, um, Allison Loveridge, who worked with us and then went on to work with Mi'kmaq Weaver Burt. 
In 2020, we did not have a field season. And in 2021, I was trapped still south of the border in the United States and I couldn't get back to the field. But we were able to arrange um, an artist retreat, a reconnaissance uh, mission, and kind of general experience of and on the land um, with Cynthia Martin really heading that up and being joined by Sarah Brooks and Hannah Martin. And those individuals are amongst the five of us. We had that great introduction at the beginning from Catherine. So we are all going to be sharing our experiences with this project and how we have each come to know the ancestors. And really one of the main points we'd like to make in our presentation tonight is that by expanding our team, the members of the team that we include, the different kinds of expertise that we all bring to our team, we are really, that is the, the, the pathway for expanding our ancestral knowledge. And how we would like to explore this, what we'd like to do is how can we start from here? And here, what we're looking at, these are some of the many rocks that Cynthia Martin collected and Alyssa Abram collected, um, and all of us actually, in their first year joining our crew in 2017, as we explored many places around the Chignecto Peninsula. And how can we move from these beautiful examples of some of the geology in this incredible area of the world to these, which are uh, weavings that Cynthia Martin created, in part inspired by some of these rocks and geological features that she was seeing on the land as we were exploring that region in 2017. To this, uh, an exhibit that Cynthia and Sarah Brooks um, installed at the NASCAD University exhibit space in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, some of this also inspired by Cynthia's engagement in the field, um, including some of her weavings, which are displayed in that photo, and also some of her ceramic work as well. And then finally, out to this, where we have photographed here Cynthia working at her loom to create a handmade, handwoven hemp tarp that we then used in our excavations in the summer of 2019. So Cynthia will be talking in more detail about that later, but this is the general theme we want to build on here is how do we move out from these objects that we have collected and kind of admired the beauty of to a way that this is connecting and really affecting the, the way we are doing our work on the Chignecto Peninsula. So we spoke at the very beginning just uh, to get a little clarification of the regions that we're speaking of. So we mentioned Segnict and um, Sebeganagadi districts of Mi'kmaq, of Mi'kma'ki. Um, Segnict meaning the drainage area and Sebeganagadi meaning the area of the wild potato or turnip. And the two maps that you see before you, it's probably for those of you from the region are very familiar with these two different maps of the districts of Mi'kma'ki. Um, the one on the left is created by Roger Lewis and Trudy Sable. It's part of the cultural landscapes section of the Mi'kmaq way, uh, I'm sorry, of the Mi'kmaq um, digital atlas, Mi'kmaq place names. And on the right, we have um, an image uh, by Mi'kmaq way Jabert, the Mi'kmaq way Jabert Cultural Center. And if you look closely, you can see that the divisions between the districts are actually different. With the Signic district um, being the, perhaps, and the Subbanagadi district being perhaps the, the most different. So depending on which interpretation, and Lewis and Sable are very clear to say that some of the districts that we know currently are really as a result of post-contact political maneuverings, and that these districts would have varied over time. They wouldn't necessarily have been stable and have very definitive lines. Um, but depending on which interpretation we work with, the work that we do could be in one or both of these districts. So to clarify a little bit, when, when we are talking about the work that we do, when we're writing grants, um, when we're writing up our results, we often refer to a region um, called the Chignecto Peninsula. And this is a term that we often hear from the geological folks in the world. Ralph Stay seems to be one of the folks who is using this region, um, referring to this geological region very frequently in his publications. 
And we um, have really been focusing our work on this little triangle of land that sticks out into um, where basically where the Minas Basin and the Bay of Fundy meet. And so this is where a lot of our work has focused and we see some of the place names there. Um, Holzbank right there on the, the middle of the eastern edge of the Chignetto Peninsula is where we have focused most of our work. And again, many of you are probably very familiar with this region and some of the stories associated with the Chignetto Peninsula. Um, obviously, at the where we are meeting the Bay of Fundy and the Minas Basin, uh, there's massive tidal action. We know about the, the tidal power that is trying to be harnessed in that area. We also, I think um, Shaw and his colleagues in a 2010 article describe the moment when the tides are changing at right there at, um, at Cape Door or El Muchduktuk, that there's more water rushing through that channel um, than all of the rivers in the world. So it's an incredible landscape. It's marked by big actions, big uh, cliffs, big hills, big tidal action. And this, as we say in many of our publications, as a perfect setting for stories of big characters and big people like Glooscap himself. And one of those stories is the creation of this, this water and landscapes, including um, the story about the great beaver who dammed this body of water and flooded the region and created havoc for the people. And Glooscap, one of his actions was to break the dam. And this is in fact, one of the stories that Shaw and his colleagues use as one of the one of pieces of evidence to explain a possible barrier that may have existed, the blocking off um, the eastern the eastern half of the Minas Basin from the rest of the Bay of Fundy that was destroyed um, about 3,400 years ago. There's also the story of the um, Hoken, the spine or the boar's back that Glooscap raised. This runs um, more or less along River Hibbert, north of Homespenk or Nouveau Lake, and uh, has been described as a passageway to connect Mi'kmaq from one region to another. Um, this is also a region that in post-contact times that European settlers use this travel route um, to come from areas currently in New Brunswick, down through River Hibbert, portaging through Nouveau Lake and the other lakes in that district, coming to the Parsborough River and then to the Minas Basin. Um, there's also been a question, and this is, uh, people on the call probably know about this. We're happy to chat more about a possible portage from um, Odumujek to Oltmul, um, so Advocate Harbor to Spencer's Island. Um, there's been some speculation about that, and part of our work in 2017 was trying to find a way to confirm that. Um, and then also stories that we hear, uh, oral histories of Ilnu paddling from the Atlantic Ocean over to New Brunswick in one day, harnessing the tidal action of the Minas Basin to navigate the Minas Basin, the Shubenacadie River, and uh, up through the River Hibbert. So it's a place that is a region that's seen a great deal of travel, a great deal of movement of individuals um, for thousands of years. And so it's, a, it's an incredible region, incredibly rich region in which to work. So our project really started um, with some of the objectives that the Mi'kmaq Way de Burke Cultural Center has, some of the research objectives that it has had over its long existence. And it really began with some conversations with Leah Rosenmeyer and Sharon Farrell and Gerald Glode about some of the work that they had done along this north shore of the Minas Basin to um, locate what they call places of convergence. So essentially, and I have a couple of maps that will illustrate this, places where there is a convergence of different kinds of information related to how Ilnu used this landscape over time. And so our goal was what, what Mi'kmaq Way Debert identified as a priority when we first began having these conversations in 2014 and 15, was to use archeology span to try to confirm some of these other forms of evidence. And uh, an additional goal related to that is to confirm that any remains of archeological sites or ancestors may have survived or the massive erosion that happens along those shorelines and development 
Um, and so, so confirming anything that we might be able to see that is actively eroding. And also to test our hypotheses, a kind of broad hypothesis, the hypothesis that where Elnook have dwelled in the recent past will have evidence of dwelling in the distant past as well. So to illustrate what that looks like, um, again, building on this idea from the folks at Mi'kmaq Way Dubert of places of convergence, what we're seeing in this image, this is this a base map that was created by a graduate student here at William & Mary, Nick Beluzzo, and it is a topographic map that's been overlaid with a bedrock geology map. And um, it's also indicating um, various Mi'kmaq place names, and also at the time, places we knew where there had been archaeological sites or find spots. And as folks like Sarah Bielans and, and the Boreas crew know, and people who have studied this area, um, there has not been a lot of systematic research-based archaeology done in this region. There has been some, but not a lot. So a lot of our archaeological evidence is relying on um, find spots, isolated finds. So that's what's indicated here on this slide. And um, again, building on the work that Mi'kmaq Way Debert has done, they were very interested in trying to identify um, spots, uh, known sources of potential tool stone for the manufacturer of lithic tools. And um, as many of you know, there's been a great deal of research done on that. Um, at one point, a side project was possibly building on the work that Peter von Vitter had done in the 1960s to identify um, partic particularly Chalcedony source sites along the Minas Basin. Um, I think uh, Katie Quattro Robbins and Ted Fettig, Tim Fettig may have picked that project up, um, but this information was helpful for us to be able to pinpoint where we wanted to target our explorations on still this very large region of the Chignecto Peninsula. So we're, this map is indicating um, areas where there are basalt formations, where also there tends to be the kind of mineral formation to form the kinds of materials that are ideal for stone tools. And Mallory will be going into greater depth in that later in our presentation. Okay, so a brief overview of our activities over the last number of years. In 2016, we uh, started our work actually by testing a few sites um, Homsek being one of them, the other two being um, uh, Partridge Island or Blauwich Island and Spruce Island along the North Shore of the Minas Basin, where basically we had known there had been fine spots. So this was kind of a, an effort to try to confirm isolated finds in those locations. Um, in 2017, we expanded out, and I'll say a few more about words about that in a few slides down. Um, and then in 2018 and 19, we really focused, we wanted to follow up on work we had done in 2016 at Homsec or um, Nuvo Lake. So 2018 and 19, we really concentrated our efforts there. As we know, 2020 was not possible. And in 2021, we had this artist retreat and reconnaissance um, effort that was led by Cynthia. And she'll be, she'll be talking along that, about that along with um, Hannah and Sarah as well. So I'll say just a very few words, and I do have some additional slides that we've saved for the very end in case there are questions about um, sort of more details about the archaeology that we've done. But at Holmesbank or Nouveau Lake, this is an important area in part because there, there is a known community of Mi'kmaq who lived in this area um, as late as the mid 20th century. And Doug Knockwood and his family members were among those people. But we have archival documentation um, indicating Mi'kmaq were there in the 18th century as well. So we know, so this idea that if there are Mi'kmaq dwelling in the recent past that we might find evidence in the distant past, this is an ideal place to test this hypothesis. Also, um, at Homsek, there had been many isolated finds um, before we came to this site. And we recovered a few more in the, the limited excavations we have done so far. Um, and as we see, this third bullet point is talking about some of the many names, and these are only some of the many Mi'kmaq names um, that, of people who have lived here. And I'll come back to these names and family names and their importance in a couple of slides. Uh, in 2016, at the same time, um, this uh, 
fl reduction flake, which we are still uncertain about the material type, and we are very eager to hear what the gathered community here has to say about this material type, and Mallory will say more about that as well. Um, but this, Mallory and Jody found this flake uh, at about 26 centimeters below surface, our very first year at Homesick, and uh, was found in association with charcoal. Um, and that charcoal was dated uh, to around 3,300 years ago. So this would put it in what archaeologists refer to as the late archaic period or the not so recent people period um, using the, the technique, the chronology chronology that Roger Lewis has developed. Um, we wanted to confirm that uh, what we were seeing was anthropogenic. And so we returned to Kwamsek with that goal in 2018. But in the meantime, in 2017, we expanded our spatial scope by uh, exploring other areas, specifically along the, that north shore of the Minas Basin. Um, and in doing so, we also expanded our crew and we expanded our ancestral knowledge. And this, I think, was a key turning point for our project because we, it was really in these moments exploring all of these many places, and I have lots of slides to show this, where we began to learn from each other, to identify the different expertise that each member of our team had. And that happened while we were exploring shorelines, looking in banks to see if we could find evidence of any erosion, while uh, Mallory was showing uh, us all about the different geological formations, and while we were sharing all of our expertise, while Cindy was advising us on the best ways to, uh, to rehabilitate lawns as we were excavating them and using her landscape backgrounds and best way to ensure the regrowth of the vegetation that we were disturbing. This all began to happen in 2017. And as we were preparing for tonight's presentation, um, one of the, the things we really wanted to make sure we talked a lot about is that experience of being on the land and near the water and sometimes in the water together and these incredible places that um, for many of us, this is the first time that we have had access and the opportunity to be in these places and to learn from each other while we're in these places. So just moving, I'll move kind of quickly through these, moving kind of from west to east as we were visiting many of these locations, many of these places of convergence that we spoke about a couple of slides ago, um, in part looking for evidence of sites that might be eroding, but also looking for isolated finds. Um, that may be uh, there on the shoreline. And places like Horseshoe Cove, Cape Door, many of you are, are aware of, um, it's a place where you can find the isolated finds on, on or near the surface. Um, Spruce Island is very interesting. This is one of the places that we actually did some test excavating in 2016. And the photo in the top right corner, uh, Jody Howe is very small in the middle ground. She's getting some of our gear together. You know, as again, many of you probably know, with the tidal action in the Minas Basin, it can be a very dangerous place to work. The tide comes in very rapidly. Um, and at Spruce Island, where we were working, this was the kind of situation where in the morning, we could paddle our gear and ourselves across um, the little strait of water to get to the area we were excavating. But by the end of the day, we would have to walk and drag our, our portage basically back um, because the tide had changed so dramatically. So making sure we were timing our, our journeys to these sites was very important. And here's a beautiful image of Blauwich or Partridge Island where we did some of this work. But as I said off the top, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about Holspenk or at the lake or Nouveau Lake. And thank you to Steve Garson and the crew at Boreas Heritage Consulting for creating this gorgeous drone image looking northeast uh, from Nouveau Lake, from the hills to the west of Nouveau Lake. Um, this incredible place where so many Mi'kmaq have spent the recent and the distant past. And in the lower left-hand corner of this image, we have an aerial photograph, um, courtesy of Kerr Canning, a native of Apple River. Thank you, Kerr. 
um, from 1933 that um, it's a little small to see, but already you can see a little bit of the, the changes that have occurred over the last century. Um, one thing to note is a big change has been in the beach at the north end of the lake, which um, has become is essentially disappeared. Um, it's quite prominent in the aerial photograph and is very little bit remains today. So I'm going to say just a couple of words about um, the archaeological testing that we've done at Homespenk over the next few years. So focusing here on 2018 and 2019. So I will be very clear in saying that our work so far has been modest. We have um, excavated partially two one by one units. We did that in 2018. Um, in 2019, the Boreas crew came and very generously donated their time and expertise to do some ground penetrating radar um, survey of this site um, that's shown here and also of a possible area where um, Doug Knockwood and other Mi'kmaq believe there may be burials a little bit north of where we are indicated here um, and on the west side of highway number two in some low hills that are there. So nothing definitive came up from the GPR work, but I think more exploration is probably warranted. We weren't able to continue excavating um, at this top site uh, in 2019 because there had been severe flooding in the winter and springtime. So we weren't able to return there. We are concerned about the condition of that site and we are hoping to be back there to finish that work this summer. Um, instead, in 2019, we moved a little bit south to a terrace that's located about 200 meters south of that original site and um, did various test, test pits, about 13 test pits in that area. Again, very difficult. It was very wet in that area. Um, and one of those test pits was positive for um, basically micro debitage. And I'm about to wrap up my comments on the archaeology and Mallory is going to pick up talking more about the lithic finds, many of which she herself found. Um, partly this was possible because we were using nested screens of both a quarter inch and an eighth inch, which made excavating very slow, um, especially when we had very muddy sediments to work through our screens. But using those nested screens and the very keen eyes of Mallory Moran, we were able to collect some of this very fine material, um, uh, question mark of whether we would consider this micro debitage. And here um, I'm using Boland's 2000 article to categorize the different types of debitage. Um, and I've tried to categorize them based on material type from a very low magnification identification. I am not at all confident of, of those types um, and also the size. And again, Mallory will go into a little more detail about that. So now in this portion of the presentation, each of us are going to talk about that question of how we have come to meet the ancestors. And I will say just a few words before I turn it over to Mallory. Um, as in, in the introduction, I am an Aglaswium or, or English speaking woman. I'm from the beautiful island of Unamagi. And I'm very privileged to be working here at William & Mary in Virginia for the last almost 10 years. And I have had many experiences with the ancestors. I could talk for the next hour about that, but I wanted to focus on this. And I had mentioned this just a few minutes ago. Um, one of the aspects of our work, so far we've talked a lot about the archaeology, but we also do oral history work and a lot of archival research as well. And the maps that you are seeing here are a result of much of that oral history work, and much of that was shared by Doug Knockwood before his passing in 2018. Some of that he shared directly um, with staff from Mi'kmaq Wade Burt. He also shared some of that with Don Bird Awalt, who has been uh, very generous in sharing some of that information that he has received and also um, knowledge from his grandmother. And we went out on a couple of occasions with a handheld GPS to document um, from Doug's best memory where there were different dwellings um, that the Mi'kmaq people lived in, um, both on a seasonal basis and year round at Homsenk in the early 20th century. 
So we have the, these names documented and those locations around um, that northwestern and northern edge of Homesmink. Um, there are many others, and this is just a, a snapshot from one period of time. Um, there's many more names that could be documented here. Part of the reason, the, one of the ways that I have come to meet the ancestors is through an experience we had in 2019 when members of the Mi'kmaq Way Debert Elders Advisory Council were able to come and visit us in the field and come to Homesmink and be on the land with us. And that, again, was a, another turning point, I think, in our work. And it was, was so interesting to me in, in listening to the elders share their stories is that we talked very little about archaeology. As fascinating as the possible microdebitage and the variety of materials that we have, what the elders were interested in were these names, were the names of people that they were related to, that they had heard about, that um, they had maybe visited these places with in the past. They wanted to know more about those names. They wanted to share their experiences of being with those family members, maybe being in this place, coming to this place as a child, driving through this place. And this was, um, for me, one of the many ways that I have come to meet the ancestors and has really driven um, kind of the direction that our work is going. And I hope to come back to that after we've heard from our other team members and we talk about our, the future direction of our work. So I'm going to be quiet for a while and I'm going to turn our presentation over to Mallory, whom you've heard is an archeologist newly begun uh, with Parks Canada in Cape Breton and a recent PhD. We are very proud at William & Mary of Mallory and her achievements. So Mallory, I will send this over to you. Oh my gosh, thanks, Michelle. And I'm uh, flattered by your introduction. That's very sweet. Um, as Michelle said, uh, I've been working with the team since I was a graduate student at William & Mary. And so for me, it's been really neat to see how this project has grown and transformed really over time. Um, and I wanted to start um, by saying, you know, we're, we're talking today about meeting the ancestors. Um, and for me, as an Iglesia woman, I'm not meeting my ancestors when I'm working in the field. Um, but when we're out working together and when I happen to find something, um, that's a really special moment. Um, and in that moment, I feel a connection to that person who was working and living and left that object in that place. Um, and so when we're working, I'm definitely thinking a lot about the ancestors and imagining <clears throat> what their world was like, how they lived and connected with this landscape. Um, in perhaps a very different way than I am. Um, but the most important piece of this project for me has been to be a part of connecting Mi'kmaq people, our friends, to their ancestors, um, and to help bring that about by working together in this place. And I've certainly learned a lot in the process and learned to look in different ways and see different things. Um, and it's been really special to me, and it's been really humbling to be a part of. Um, and uh, since finding these objects, finding these flakes and tool stones in the field is one part of how we are meeting the ancestors for our team, I'm going to talk a little bit about the tool stone that we found in the course of our work here. And as Michelle mentioned earlier, we see a convergence between place names archaeological finds, and the geology of the area. And we see that there's long-term knowledge about this landscape that's connected to and contained within Mi'kmaq oral history. And um, the reason we have tool stone source locations in this area of the Minas Basin is because of the presence of this large basalt formation called North Mountain Basalt that runs parallel to the Bay of Fundy primarily along its southern edge here. Um, it's depicted here on the map in kind of an orangey beige color. And we also see this basalt popping up in several locations along the northern shore, including at Cape Door, Spruce Island, Partridge Island, Two Islands, and Five Islands. So, Faults have formed in this basalt and over thousands of years, these faults have been filled in with a number of different quartz-based precipitates. 
and a variety of other mineral deposits. And the quartz-based deposits vary in their degree of crystallization, ranging from really glassy or waxy crypto-crystalline deposits to deposits with macro-crystallization, so they're fully crystallized. Um, and I want to mention that as I'm talking about these deposits and using this language about crystallization, I'm drawing on Leah Rosenmeier's dissertation work. Um, she's done quite a lot uh, to develop language to talk about the structure of toolstone materials in this area. So Michelle, if you want to go to the next slide. So we've been frequently finding crypto crystalline quartz materials from this area in our excavations. And these different quartz based toolstones have a great deal of variation in color and texture across the North Mountain basalt. And we're still figuring out the best way to determine the most likely point of origin for the toolstone materials that we find on site. Um, one thing to note here that's kind of interesting is that the presence of these quartz-based materials and gemstones and a number of other rare minerals has led the, to the development of um, kind of a very active community of local mineral collectors, um, mostly based out of Parsboro, Nova Scotia. Uh, and there's a lot of local expertise about the variation in these deposits across this basalt. And we've worked with and interviewed many people over the years, including Eldon George, who's sadly passed on, um, and many others. Um, and I'm sharing these images of the different cryptal crystalline quartz samples from various locations um, across this North Mountain basalt. Uh, so you can get a sense of the variety of color and pattern present in these materials. So you can go to the next slide, Michelle. So these are some flakes uh, recovered during our excavations at Holmes Bank in 2018. And based on the color and texture of the patterning in these flakes, these may have come from Ross Creek, which is quite near a uh, pretty well-known toolstone quarry site in Davidson's Cove, but a little bit away from it. Um, you can go to the next one, Michelle. Uh, this next flake has a pattern that's pretty distinctively associated with deposits in two islands, Nova Scotia. Um, it's actually offshore on the islands known as the Brothers. Um, and it's also important to note that because of the way this landscape has changed over thousands of years, there may be additional toolstone source locations that are actually located underwater now that are still part of those basalt formations. You can go to the next one. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so we've also recovered a fair quantity of flakes that appear to be the same or similar material, kind of a microcrystalline quartz, um, quartz-based material that's reddish in color, which could be rhyolite, or it could be um, a really fine grained quartzite. Uh, it has this sugary texture that's pretty distinctive. And there are a number of red microcrystalline rhyolite deposits across the Cabaquid Highlands. And so these flakes may have come from a toolstone source in that area if they're rhyolites. You can go to the next one, Michelle. Um, as Michelle mentioned, we've been uh, consistently double screening all of the soils that we excavate during our work. And um, that's enabled us to collect these pretty small flakes from the eighth inch screens. And um, some of these flakes appear to have a more sugary microcrystalline texture and others seem to have a more uh, waxy cryptocrystalline texture. And um, so the microcrystalline flakes might be more of that rhyolite material potentially that we talked about on the last slide. Or if they are quartzite, they may be from a toolstone source on the Gasparo River of White Rock. So, so here you can see the broader view of where people may have been gathering some of the toolstones that we've found at Homespunk. Um, as we've worked around the area, the colors and textures and patterns of this toolstone and of the landscape more broadly have really led to different directions for the project and inspired us in different ways. Um, and I think they've especially inspired the work of one of our colleagues who's joining us here, Cindy, who I think will be talking next. Um, Michelle, do you want to introduce Cindy? 
I would love to introduce Cindy. So Cynthia Martin, you, there was a brief introduction at the beginning, um, but just a reminder that uh, Cindy joined the project along with Alyssa Abram in 2017, and she's brought so much to the project. She is um, very humble and does not like talking about herself. She does not like it when we talk about her, but she has been a huge influence on this project. And we're so excited to have her talk about how um, she has been inspired in her work beyond the project by her time um, on the land with us. Cindy, go ahead. I thank you. Okay, so um, I guess one of the questions or the main question is um, how we met the ancestors and um, being out um, on the land um, in areas that I, I would have never have um, visited, um, I realized that uh, the ancestors are always with me. Um, and yeah, so um, let's see, I was reintroduced to the ancestors um, in um, some very sacred areas, including Nouvelle Lake. Um, and having known um, and met Charlie Paul and Doug Knockwood, um, they knew of my family and um, that was very powerful. Um, Charlie Paul in particular knew um, my uncles, my father, he knew um, our family lineage. Um, and Doug Knockwood, very um, good friends with my dad who has also passed. Um, Stephen Augustine, um, met him um, over the years and then, you know, became reconnected with him through, through this project or through my artwork, actually. Um, let's see, um, maybe some of my work here. Um, I've always loved rocks and, and collecting. And it wasn't until I met Michelle and Mallory where they explained where it came from, how it formed and um, what the material was used for. Um, so it, it was just fascinating. I've, I've, um, I've always wanted to return back to Mi'kmaq. I've lived back and forth all my life, sort of a semi-nomadic life, um, as most Mi'kmaq do. Um, and yeah, so collecting the rocks, I, I automatically saw, um, you know, the color, the pattern, the ratio, um, the ratios, um, and I, I call it divine proportion or, or you know, most things in nature, it's um, Fibonacci series or, or, or the, um, the ratios are just perfect. Everything in nature is just perfect. Um, and it also being on the land and, and collecting these things for, you know, my art projects, it made me realize that I was seeing what my ancestors saw the colors, the patterns, where they got their ideas for, um, for decorating and, um, you know, um, spiritual, um, spiritual insight, I guess. Um, so, yep, the, um, the far um, left weaving. Um, yeah, that's um, some of the chert. And the chert, of course, is the, um, the material used for um, making arrowheads. And um, it took the longest time for me to remember the word conchoidal. So <laughs> um, I have to say that Michelle and Mallory have been very, very patient um, answering the same question over and over and over again <laughs> until it just really sunk in. And the middle piece, um, it, these are all done for, um, towards my degree, uh, my BFA. Um, the middle piece, um, uh, I guess it, pretty much, I think that my artwork speaks for itself or, or I, I want the language of, of Mi'kma'ki to speak through my artwork. Um, so again, um, the, the proportions, the texture, the color, um, I tried to relay that in my, um, my fiber art. Um, it, next slide, please. Yep, um, so yes, I knew the mission. Um, I was, I, I, I just could not believe the advertisement that um, they were looking for, for field assistance and it was going to be out on, on, on the lake in this area. And I was like, well, okay. Um, I wasn't sure how my resume would read because I, I'm administrative assistant. I worked in a bank. I did landscaping, um, you name it. It was just a hodgepodge of things. So Michelle, um, 
interviewed me and invited me onto the team. And um, strange enough, it just seemed all of my different experiences just came in handy. Um, it just, it was just surreal. Um, I stepped out there, the smells, the textures, the colors, I, it just was, it was like an, an artistic explosion. <laughs> um, and I was free, I was very comfortable around Michelle and Mallory right away. I knew they were very sincere. Um, so we, we got along, all of us just famously, it was just fabulous and bouncing ideas off of each other and talking about nature, talking about um, um, sustainable materials and things like that. Um, so yeah, it, there it is. Um, it's a hemp uh, weaving, um, a bast fiber, which we use pre-contact. And, and I believe that uh, material is really um, um, used by all cultures all around the world. Um, so yep, yeah, we didn't wear it as clothing, but we did use it, um, the, the bast fibers for netting, um, um, nets, things, uh, things like that, um, bags, collecting bags. So um, when we were using the plastic tarps, um, I, it just dawned on me that, you know, a, a test pit, I, I had a loom at home um, that I could possibly weave up a, a, um, a natural um, tarp to use. So the idea is um, if we were to come back in the next year, the tarp would still be there. It would not disintegrate. And if we never came back, it would just meld right back into the environment with no harm done um, versus the, um, the plastic, um, plastic um, geo, geo tarps, they're called. Um, so uh, there was connection there. Um, the rigid head loom on the left was the first post-contact um, weaving uh, apparatus that was introduced. And we don't have much evidence of um, our weaving looms previous or pre-contact because we adopted things very easily. So the rigid heddle was um, a lot easier than the, um, the previous setup. Um, I want to give credit to um, Jolene Gordon, who um, she was with the Nova Scotia Museum, um, non-native, but she was a knowledge keeper. Um, I had her curatorial report for decades, holding on to these things um, for when I returned back and I knew someday I would to finish my degree. And that was like 30 years in the making. <laughs> so um, her work was instrumental. Um, it, it, the knowledge that she kept um, was, it, it is just um, fabulous. Um, so with that said, um, yep, we, um, we used the, um, the top four uh, for that pit and we dedicated um, that pit where Mallory had some finds um, to Charlie Paul and Doug Knockwood. Next slide, please. Uh, this is Stephen Augustine. Uh, he's holding a um, vessel, um, a pre-contact shape vessel um, made out of clay. It, that clay in particular was not from Mi'kma'ki. It, um, it was from the art college uh, from NASCAD. But I did add sand from um, from the lake there, uh, the pink sand, um, to incorporate it into um, to the clay to, to make it more uh, meaningful. So I, I gifted that to Steve Augustine during, um, oh, it was an art show. And um, at that point, he told me that he was actually related to Doug Knockwood. So, you know, just more and more connections just seemed to happen all these little bits and pieces were just coming together just wonderfully for me. Um, and it was an honor to be able to present him with a, um, with a clay vessel and um, filled with sand from, from Newville Lake. Um, the pieces down below, um, wax resists on the left um, and a glaze. Uh, I, we did not use glazes um, um, pre-contact, although we did um, use a method where we close the pores up. Of, um, of the clay. Um, I'm still exploring um, um, how uh, the liquids and, and berries were, were kept inside the vessels. Um, and let's see, so the shape of the vessel, of course, um, it's, we didn't use tabletop, so it would be um, sort of screwed into the, into the dirt, into, um, 
the sand or or the mud or wherever um, things were being uh, stored or possibly hanging from a tree. Um, my imagination brings me to a uh, deer horn or, or um, uh, horns where you could pick the vessels out of um, some heated coals for, for cooking. So on next slide, please. And um, this leads me to um, a display that Sarah Brooks and I, um, we had a shared vision. Um, both her dad and my dad knew each other. Um, she's from um, Seven Agony and I'm from um, Millbrook, um, not that far away from each other. Um, so the, the, the clay pieces um, uh, are based again on the Fibonacci series or, or divine proportion that we find in nature. So it was a series of, of plates going um, uh, by ratio, by, by size. Um, let's see. And then again, we have the, um, the, um, hemp, uh, weavings underneath, um, and uh, along the outer edge of the large piece are, um, Waltez pieces. So, um, Waltez is a, um, a dice game and it was the pieces were made out of horn. These were made out of clay. So, um, yep. Meeting Sarah was just another wonderful um, part of my journey. And um, this is our collaboration together. And um, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah now to, um, to speak more about our work and her work in particular. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy. And I'm very pleased to introduce again, Sarah Brooks, an artist and craftsperson. Uh, she's currently working on her MFA at Nazca University and very furiously writing her MA thesis. So I'm very grateful for her to take some time out to join us tonight and talk about her work. Sarah, please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle and Cindy and Mallory <laughs> for speaking so far. And yeah, so I think it makes sense maybe to start talking, like I've spent a lot of time at NASCAD University over the past number of years, and that's where I met. Cindy <laughs> in a textile studio. So yeah, we started to talk about uh, like different plant made textile pieces that were Mi'kmaq made. And that's kind of like my first taste of like that knowledge in the first place. So since that time, I've been trying to reconnect and find information about that. And like Cynthia already mentioned, um, like curatorial reports from the Nova Scotia museums and how they um, like depict like these different objects that have been made and like materials that were used in those. So I've been kind of centering my MFA currently on some of that research and thinking about like what were these materials and how they were used and like trying to do research on cattails and different marsh reeds. And it was nice to go on this trip <laughs> in the summer so we could like just be a part of the landscape and we got to collect some different materials like some clay which is really awesome to see like how to harvest it and use it and process it before you use it and fire it and also like finding some cattails in marsh areas and some of the reed grasses which are in this weaving that I did recently and so yeah I take a lot of inspiration from like landscapes and plant material and I've used like a lot of natural dyes and plant materials in my textile work and yeah like I've, I've been trying to reconnect more because I feel like I do have a large disconnection in some ways to the land itself and resources that were used historically by Mi'kmaq people myself being from Sabaganagadi First Nation it's nice to try to reconnect and be a part of different projects so it's really a great honor <laughs> to be included and also some work that I've done uh, with CMM, the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. They have a project, Mi'kmaq Place Names, which was mentioned a bit earlier with the digital atlas, with the mapping and all those place names. So I've been doing um, like some video editing and, and looking through interview footage of Mi'kmaq elders and Mi'kmaqi and learning through those oral histories and centering it on locations. So learning through like generational knowledge and trying to center that with my own current knowledge making that I'm trying to accomplish. <laughs> and yeah, just a lot of it 
keeps coming back to connection to land and like originally I probably wouldn't have thought like archaeology directly ties to the work I'm thinking about and looking at but in a big way it has and like this trip for example we went on like really centered that for me and really is helping currently like with my own thesis writing about my experiences and yeah so a lot of it always comes back to just me trying to connect to my personal experience with materials in a place and yeah I think that's probably all I have to offer right now thank you Thank you so much, Sarah. Fantastic. And last but certainly not least, Hannah Martin, um, who we did not mention in the initial introduction, but is a 2022 NDN Changemaker Fellow, which is very exciting. And I'm just so pleased to introduce her to round out this incredible group of women that we are working with. So Hannah, please go ahead. Thank you, Walal and Michelle, and Walal and um, Cindy, and um and Sarah and Mallory. Um, I really appreciate being included in this uh, talk tonight um, because as I will explain a little bit in my short talk, um, I, this is not a project that I've been involved in very long. Um, my background is in Indigenous Studies. I went to McMaster University for my uh, bachelor degree in Indigenous Studies. I've, I've never been involved in any archaeology work before. Um, and my background really um, also um, is reclaiming indigenous traditions on the land, Mi'kmaq traditions on the land, um, harvesting traditions, um, and I'm also a basket maker. So um, something that's been an interest and a passion of mine has been to reconnect with the land in these different ways over the years. But again, I've never been involved in any kind of work, uh, like meeting with the ancestors in this way. So um, I really, really appreciated the opportunity. Um, this summer I was actually on my um, summer vacation from work and uh, Cindy had let me know there was an opportunity to be a part of um, what was kind of a, a retreat in Wuhan in the in the Parsboro area with with Sarah and her um, and so I knew that Cindy who is my aunt um, had been involved in this work for quite a long time and I've always heard about it but this is the first time that I got to experience it so I decided to make a trip up to Wuhan um, stay with Cindy and Sarah for a day and experience what they had been doing with um, Michelle and Mallory and others over the years. Um, and our first stop, uh, the day that we had together was at uh, Gospemk, the lake. And I didn't really know what to expect. I was just really excited to see where Doug Knockwood and his family had their homestead and to just know that they were there. Um, and for me, just having this short, brief experience with the crew on the land um, was enough. Uh, and what obviously what you will see in this picture um, was a complete surprise to me. Um, I knew, you know, Cindy had showed me before what, what it is that we should be looking for when we're in these places and looking for um, uh, flakes made out of the, the chert. And so I, I was able to, to touch it and feel it and know what I was looking for. Um, and uh, we were only there maybe 10 minutes and I, I bent down and I started looking uh, in the water and it was like this pe this flake jumped out at me out of the water and um, it was this beautiful red uh, hue and uh, as soon as I found it I picked it up and I showed Cindy and I said is this what I'm supposed to be looking for? And she was like, where did you find that? I was like, I literally just bent over. I started to look and it was right there. Um, and so we, uh, Sarah took a, a coordinate um, so that we could come back and we knew where the, the piece came from. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I thought about um, my grandfather, Ben Martin at the time, because um, my brother, he, who is a harvester and who, who taught me a lot about what I know about being on the land, um, a teaching that he got from our grandfather was that um, when you're on the land, you look for the break in the pattern. So if you're hunting, you, you're looking in the, the, the bushes and the trees and you know, you're looking for something that, that doesn't look like it belongs there. So if you see a moose in the bushes, you know that it's not a tree. <laughs> If you're walking along the shore and you see a feather, an eagle feather, maybe you know that it's not a rock. So, you know, the way that this flake kind of leapt out at me and presented itself to me felt like um, just that it was a break in a pattern and I was able to identify it. Um, and so we celebrated together. 
Um, and, you know, in that moment, I, I think like being on the land uh, and, and having experiences on the land growing up, it's one thing to reclaim your ancient traditions on the land and know that you're doing what your ancestors did, but it was a new experience for me to be able to actually touch something that my ancestors touched and not even just touched, but worked on for maybe, you know, minutes or maybe over an hour um, on this piece. So for me, it was just such an incredible experience, um, very emotional experience as a Mi'kmaq woman to have um, in the presence of, of knowledge keepers, you know, Cindy and Sarah, I both, I consider both to be knowledge keepers, uh, Michelle and Mallory as well, though they weren't there that day. So um, it was just a very special day. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to share this story today um, with everyone um, about my, my uh, encounter with the ancestors and um, to express my gratitude to the team um, for including me um, and in hopes that, you know, I, I hope that in the future I have more opportunities to be a part of this work. Um, I think that the work also that Cindy and Sarah do, especially with, um, you know, um, the creations that they make, they are the future ancestors. We are the future ancestors and what we create, um, we're doing what our ancestors did. So I, I think that it is a very much um, an ode to that circle of knowledge. Um, what we are doing, what we continue to do as Mi'kmaq people and, and allies. Um, and so I just have a lot of uh, gratitude and um, I wanna honor everybody. So thank you, Walalio. Walal and Hannah, and Walal Yoke to everyone who shared their experiences. And I cannot really say much more or better than that, but I will talk a little bit about what we are working on now, what we hope to do. Um, we have some publications that are coming out. We have a, a chapter coming out in the new um, Far Northeast volume that's coming out next month. We're very excited to be building on many of the themes that we talked about today in a, a contribution for a special issue of American Anthropologist on Indigenous Futurities that's edited by Lindsay Montgomery and Heather Law Pezzarossi. And I think I saw that Lindsay is on this call today, which is amazing. Um, we plan to go back to uh, Quomsec for to hopefully wrap up um, some of the excavations that we began and were unable to finish before. Um, and we are currently piloting a project with the Mi'kmaq Way to Burke Cultural Center for um, sharing much of the data that we have gathered over the years. We're doing that work by focusing on archival data, focusing on um, the 1871 census. We're working with a couple of graduate students here at William & Mary. Um, it's a very exciting project because, as some of you may know, the content management system that Mi'kmaq Wager Burt has developed has been developed with Mi'kmaq communities in mind, with Mi'kmaq language in mind, with a Mi'kmaq worldview in mind. It's a database unlike any other, and it is going to be able to track Elnu people and families, individuals and families across space and through time. Um, and we're really excited to be able to contribute our data um, in that way. So we will conclude there. Um, just a quick thank you to many, many, many organizations who helped this project either with funding, moral support, writing letters of support, providing technology and expertise. Um, these are some of those groups. And uh, here is a longer list of some of the individuals who have helped us over the many years of this project and we hope will continue. To, so Wolaliuk to all of those people, Wolaliuk to all of you for listening and we are happy to take questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, for sharing your stories and your experiences on this project. That is a wonderful presentation. Um, do we have any questions in the audience? Feel free to unmute yourself, turn on your camera, and uh, and ask away. No. Oh, sorry. I thought I did. Catherine, yes, please. All right. If somebody else has a question, you can take them first. No, go ahead, please. Okay. Um, well, thank you all for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. It was, um, I really loved the way that you brought together sort of archaeology, geology, um, art, um, 
I, it really just is uh, wonderful and it's a lot to sort of take in and think about. So, um, but I, I am coming from an archeological perspective, I admit, but one of the things I'd be curious to know your feeling on is um, it feels like, the, yeah, um, how am I gonna uh, say this? In what way do you see, it's almost as if um, we don't, maybe the archeology span itself is not as uh, central as some of us tend to uh, perhaps think it, it should, it maybe has been in the past. And I'm wondering if you see, or if you could maybe elaborate on the place that you see sort of more conventional archeology span playing in your research in the future. Um, and maybe it doesn't have to, which I think is another possibility, but I just would like to hear more on, on your ideas on that, I guess. Great. Thank you, Catherine, for getting us started off. And I, I think we can all contribute to that in some ways. So I'll start the response by saying that we have taken many of our cues from Mi'kmaq Wee to Bert. That, as I said, this is how this project started. Um, and part of the reason that I dwelled a little bit on the elders' reaction when they visited in 2019 um, is in part in relation to this question that the archaeology itself, um, obviously, you know, they are advising on the interpretation of this incredibly important Paleo-Indian site um, that, that Mi'kmaq Wee Burt will interpret. So there's certainly a great appreciation and understanding of the importance of archaeology um, for understanding the Mi'kmaq past. Um, as far as this project goes, it seems to be a little bit of a le lesser priority to do new archaeological work. And so, um, and now that is not to say that there couldn't be more work done. There's much more work that could be done. Um, Sarah Bielans and the Boreas crew have done an extensive research a little further north in the Chignecto Isthmus area. And one of their points is that there just has not been enough systematic research-based archeology span done in this region. So there's certainly lots ahead of us. Um, but for the, the priorities of our project is really to listen to what is needed and wanted from communities and the elders um, are bringing what is needed and wanted from their communities to the work that Mi'kmaq Wade DeBird is doing. And so um, part of that is our direction working on contributing our data in a way that will be meaningful to communities through the content management system. And also I think building on some of the work that we're seeing through um, Cynthia and Sarah, where they're, they are often working with legacy collections related to other archeological sites. So what can we do um, in an ethical and responsible way with material that has already been disturbed? Um, are there opportunities for research in the, the amazing collections that already exist around Mi'kma'ki? Um, so that's my answer, but I would open it up also to Mallory and Cynthia and Sarah and Hannah. I think that was a wonderful description. Yes, I um, learning or being in the field. Um, I think it's. I, I I do believe that the archaeology is important. Um, when I said it's, it, speaking through my artwork, I can I can give depth to my work. I can speak to um, a larger audience about archaeology, about the finds, and how it um, how it influenced my work. Um, and uh, you know, meeting up with Sarah and 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 Hannah um, around this, it's um, I was able to pass some knowledge on to them, and it's up to them how you know how they want to um, to um, to go forward with it. So it's um, it, it, it's part of the two-eyed seeing. You know, you the um, the system, the European system of archaeology is is well established and um, acceptable around the world, I guess. It's, so it's a system it's, um, that we need, it seems, to, to reclaim our history and put our history, the pieces back together again. But it also allows um, the creative aspect of it, it's, which just comes natural, um, just comes natural for most of us, I guess, right? So um, it really gives depth. I, I um, yeah, I feel comfortable talking about it through my artwork. I guess that's the medium that I'd be able to um, communicate out um, and hopefully spark interest in, in the future generations uh, to continue this important work. So, right, that helps. <laughs> uh, 
Awesome. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Tim Treen asked, um, for those who are Indigenous archaeologists, how would you suggest uh, non-Indigenous people go about archaeology in the Americas? Anyone wants to tackle that question? That's a pretty broad question. I don't claim to be an archaeologist. No. So, yeah. Um, I, think, I think this can piggyback on, I, I had a question that I was going to ask, and, and, and that is, you know, <clears throat> I've had the opportunity to work on projects similar to this, um, integrating two-eyed seeing and, and Indigenous perspectives and, and community-based programs, and uh, I think they're extremely valuable for, for both the Indigenous communities and, and the archaeological communities, but um, what suggestions would you have for archaeologists for how we can, um, you know, maybe make our work more accessible to Indigenous communities. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but. And I don't want to just put you on the spot, Cindy. This is open <laughs> to you, all of your collaborators, so you can, you can feel free to punt the ball to them. <laughs> but. Well, I just based on the experience I had with Michelle and, and Mallory initially, and then also with Vanessa, um, they're just really sincere that they, you know, um, they wanted us included. They, you know, it's, they did all the groundwork. They did all the hard work. Michelle writing the grants, pulling all this together. Um, I had no stress whatsoever. I, I really wanted to be there. I wanted to um, contribute. I wanted to find what we needed to find um, in order to um, validate the work that we were doing. But again, you know, my mind takes off in other directions. Um, you know, yeah. seeing, you know, the, the strata going strata through strata. <laughs> the colors. There was, there was one pit where uh, Michelle uncovered like this um, fine, sparkly gray um, sand. I, it just blew my mind. It just fascinated me. So, I mean, that was an important, um, that was, that was, all of it was just important. I, do, I don't know how to describe it. It's just, if you're really sincere um, and you come to a, a, an understanding early on, um, it shouldn't be an issue. I don't know how else to, um, based on my experience with um, Michelle, Mallory, and, and Vanessa, it, it couldn't have worked out better, but so good luck. <laughs> <laughs> if I could add something to you. Yes, please, question. Mallory, yes. Um, I think um, I just want to echo what Cindy said, but I also want to highlight all the work that Michelle did to kind of come through the community and to advertise um, in the Mi'kmaq Malice Daily News to find people to work with us and um, going through Mi'kmaq Debert and they already have a robust research program. Um, but then in the, and, and like working, when we were all working together, you know, we were all working side by side and it was a very collaborative experience. We were also living together, which was great fun. Um, and we just really got to know each other really well. Um, and I think that um, familiarity enabled us all to open up to each other and to really ask um, different kinds of questions about uh, the work as we were doing it together. And um, I think having that really open communication and sharing was a key part of what has made this such um, a wonderful project to be a part of. Well said, thank you for sharing that, Melanie. Um, just to go back to the chat real quickly, uh, Moira McCaffrey said, thank you for this excellent, inspiring presentation. Sorry, I have to leave early. Uh, Solène Gauthier said, thanks everyone for the presentation. I really love seeing the fiber arts being integrated. Yes, I will echo that uh, in the archaeological work and how it related to connecting to the past and being on the land. Very well said. Uh, John Fries added, uh, I don't really have a question, but I'm just going to say thank you for this presentation and for your time. Uh, I love soaking in new information as well as new perspectives, especially from those who have uh, years and years of, of careful education under their belt. So kudos to, to all of you. Um, do we have any other questions in the chat at this time? 
Uh, Joseph, yes, I see your hand up. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation, everyone. It was wonderful to uh, hear from all of you. I was wondering if, uh, I mean, to me, this looks like a poster child for what to do right in terms of academic reconciliation. Um, and I'm wondering if any of you have thought of framing it in that way for meetings or for papers or those sorts of things. Well, thank you, Joseph, for that question. Um, so we we actually have and um, we'll be working on what we hope will be a book next year that is framed around reconciliation as a kind of key concept. Um, I, I will say speaking from, as an academic based in the United States, I am very, um, and we've talked about this as a group as well as we're working on our various projects, um, I'm very wary of performativity. And so I don't want to just say the things that sound right and look good in a meme um, and are easily tweetable. Um, I actually want to do the hard work of, of trying to reconcile. And so um, that's, yeah, that maybe I'll leave it there. Well, Michelle um, has, has done years of work with um, Picto Landing and um, if you can um, win the hearts of some of the elders on these reserves, you're in. <laughs> she, uh, she comes highly recommended. Um, I didn't really know that much about her until I had met her and then the pieces fell together. But yeah, so um, it, it's, Michelle's been working here for years and she's really earned the trust of a lot of people. Um, so yeah, I think that contributes to, um, that's just a lot. That just says a lot about Michelle, and it says a lot about, um, yeah, how, how we feel about her and trust her and the, and the people that she brings in. So, you know, it's, it, you know, bringing in Mallory and then, and then Vanessa, um, another girl, um, Allison. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, if, you know, I just, it's, it's just been wonderful. And Michelle's proved herself time and time again. And I, I really hope that opportunity for most people that want to um, work in the Americas um, with the different tribes. You know, just believe in yourself and, and, you know, be sincere. And I think you'll do very well and you'll be appreciated. It's very humbling, Cindy. And I can't say how much that all of us have learned from Cynthia and her work and her wisdom. So it's really um, inspired our project. Also, speaking of picture landing, shout out to Petra Moody, who is here on this call, uh, who helped a great deal on that project in picture landing, um, looking at the pollen samples that we collected on Maligomish. So it's great to see Dr. Moody here. Uh, <laughs> raise hand. Hello, Petra. Hi. Hello, hello, uh, Trevor, and hello, Michelle. So good to see you, and thank you, and thank your team for a fantastic presentation. I learned a ton, and I love the, as you do so well, the integration of the arts and sciences and philosophy and anthropology, archaeology. Uh, beautiful. Thank you, and well presented, all of you. Thank you. I have a simple-minded question, um, and it's probably because I don't watch the news enough, but is your art exhibit on still on Cynthia and Sarah, the NASCAD ex exhibition? Is it still on? No, that was some, I, what was it, two uh -huh. years ago, Sarah? I missed it, oh, and I'm yeah. so sad. It looks just <laughs> beautiful, and that weaving with the uh, actual reeds and things interwoven there. That is just breathtaking, absolutely gorgeous. And finally, Michelle, you showed one slide with Leak Lake on it. And Leak Lake, um, when I was a student at Dalhousie a million years ago, I act we did a pollen diagram for that, which I thought might be interesting because it's a very special place. The lake is very, very deep. And so the mud at the bottom, you can actually slice it almost into years and see how things changed over a very short amount of time. 
And I wondered, you showed the slide, but you never mentioned the lake. It's yeah, well spotted. Yeah. <clears throat> so in fact, we went to that lake in part for it's one of these places of convergence. So we had heard oral histories of Mi'kmaq families spending time at the lake. We knew it was this glacial lake and we knew um, in part from the, the publication that Mi'kmaq Wade Burt put together um, about the, the pollen work that had been done um, and the radiocarbon dates that are associated with that. Um, I, and I'd love to talk with you offline, uh, Dr. Moody, more about that because I think it was, the, the timelines are very interesting and the resolution. Um, and uh, some of the work that Daryl Reitman did in that area to understand the, the paleo period and the relationship of Nouveau Lake to the other lakes is very interesting. And I, I think um, I would love to know more about you know, what, what we're seeing in those very long time depths. Is there something comparable to what we're seeing at DeBert um, in that area of the world as well? And, and Ralph Stay has a lot to say about that. Um, and I, and the, the geology is incredibly important. And we have talked about that um, many, many, many hours. Um, and having a professional ar ar geologist would help us out a great deal. So yeah, <laughs> thank you for the question. Great, good luck and um, nice to see you again. Thank you, Petra. Um, I did want to add in, I missed at the very beginning of the chat, Eve Williams mentioned, uh, many thanks, love the geological link with the flakes. It makes the Minas shore even more captivating. Um, and I couldn't agree more. Catherine, I see you have your hand up again, please. Yes, I go ahead. I have a very quick question. Um, oh. I was really interested in the, and really struck by um, the, you know, the beautiful uh, textiles, I think Cynthia and Sarah that you were working on. And I, you were inspired by particular objects or particular rocks that you had found. And I'm wondering if, um, you would be able to tell us a little bit about why you selected those particular uh, pieces. Well, <laughs> when I first started collecting, Michelle and Mallory sort of laughed and said, you know, you look like us the first year we were out here. <laughs> Every rock was like, oh my gosh, this looks like a, this looks like a blouse and a skirt. <laughs> I put it, and we were just bogged down with all these rocks. Um, so yeah, it's just it. Again, it just it, it was just this um, artistic explosion of, of colors and patterns, and yeah, I, it just was there. And um, yeah, I don't even know how to describe it. It was years ago where I was. Um, one thing that I. Um, I remembered from decades ago, I started my degree when my son was just small and life happened, then I went back to finish. But one of the things that uh, the professors said there at the art college was that um, everything in nature is perfect. Just perfect proportions, um, color to color patterns. So what she, she brought us to an exercise. She says, um, get a rock and look at the rock. And she said, really look at the rock. So um, under a microscope, we saw um, so many different colors. So what she did, she had us, um, it, since everything in nature is perfect, the ratios and colors and things like that, um, she made us do a graph. And then we just figured out the ratio of color to each other. And then no matter where you put it on the graph, as long as you had the ratios correct, your pattern or your um, was perfect. So um, because of the, the, the ratios in nature. So to me, it's, um, it's divine proportion. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> so I mean, again, that was a teaching from a long time ago. And again, the pieces just fell into place. And you know, if I, if I could um, convey the smells that I um, experienced through my weavings, I would, but that might not be possible. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. Thank you. You're welcome. Excellent. Thank you both. All right. Is there any more questions from the chat? I have a quick question for <clears throat> Sarah. I wonder if she has an MFA exhibit coming up that maybe people can see if they're in the Halifax area. 
Yeah, thanks, Michelle. <laughs> yeah, um, my thesis show is actually coming up in March, on March 22nd to be exact. <laughs> and yeah, um, the gallery is the Anna Lee Nolan's Gallery at NASCAD University. So that will be in person and they also post like on their social media pages about the shows usually. So even if you can't make it in person, Alfax, like, yeah, you could still probably check it out on social media. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Congratulations, Sarah. Awesome. Well, before I let you guys go, I um, or before another question comes in, perhaps, uh, I wanted to celebrate this auspicious event by giving away some books. Uh, anyone who knows me knows that I'm very keen on disseminating knowledge. Uh, so, uh, Michelle, you had plugged it at the end of your presentation, but you folks have a, a chapter coming out in Gabe and Ken's new book. Uh, so I wanted to draw a name for that, and, um, and we'll get a copy of that when it comes out next month to the winner. Um, and the winner, I just drew some names here, was Vanessa Smith for that. So Vanessa, I will send you an email and give you details and we will, uh, we will send you a copy of that book. But I also wanted to give away a copy. We still have a couple of copies of Gabe, uh, Dr. Reinick and Matt Betts's book, uh, The Archaeology of the Atlantic Northeast. And I wanted to give away a copy of that tonight. And uh, oh, lucky winner. One of my former students is he's, he's still online. Let me see. Mark, are you online? Yes, you are. Mark Robinson, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I'll uh, shoot you an email, Mark, and you can swing by my office sometime when you're on campus and, and pick it up. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Excellent. Are there any other questions? Awesome. I just wanted to sit. Sorry, I didn't know how to raise my hand. So no, I no just... worries, Tim. Please go ahead. I just wanted to say um, thank you and it was really interesting because I've heard about indigenous archeology span in a classroom and what it is by definition, but I've never heard um, people who identify themselves as indigenous or part indigenous um, actually speak about it. And it's very interesting. And I, I'm glad I got to hear that because I am, I will fortunately be doing CRM work in uh, Northern BC this summer around um, in Indigenous territory. So I'm, I'm glad I got to hear that. So thank you. Thanks, Tim. Um, yes, and, and Sarah V. Lenz just chimed in. Thank you for the wonderful presentation evening. I learned a great deal and enjoyed it very much. Uh, couldn't have been uh, more well said, Sarah. Um, so uh, with that, uh, on behalf of the APAB and the, uh, the NSAS and the uh, U of T Arc Center, I would just like to express my sincere gratitude to Michelle, uh, to Cindy, Hannah, Sarah, and Mallory for giving your time and your expertise to all of us this evening. And thank you to everyone who joined us. Um,